many of you guys in here who, who know Jesus, I'm willing to bet that in your life, if you reflect on it, there were a chain of events, chain of people or circumstances that brought you to a saving faith in Christ. Maybe as a kid, somebody brought you to church. And with each event, each link, God was exposing to you more of who he is, revealing to you his character until one day you get to the end and you realize Jesus is the true and living God. He is my Lord and Savior, and you accept him. And what I love about this analogy and this illustration, a couple reasons why I love this. For one, when you look at it, every link from God's perspective is the same. In the sense that no one link is more important or less important than the other. Every link is, in God's view, it is his pursuit. It is what he is using to pursue the one who is spiritually lost. I want to encourage you guys today because sometimes we feel like it's up to us. Right? And my success depends on if this person says yes or no or, 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 or not. And and there's this temptation to feel that pressure because if they don't say yes and I don't see people come to Jesus, then I feel like I've failed or I'm unsuccessful or I'm inadequate. And there's great discouragement in that. And I want to prove to you today that your role is more significant than you know. That God wants to use you as a link in a chain of another person and that without your role, that chain may not be complete. Well, if there's anybody in the Bible, in the New Testament, whom people back then would say, he would never give his life to Christ, it is impossible. I would place my bets on this Pharisee named Saul. And so I want to show you the links in the chain in Acts chapter 9 of how God was pursuing even the worst of sinners. And so here we go, Acts chapter 9, verse 1. It starts off like this. But Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise, enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who are, were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. And so here's Paul with an agenda and with a plan. And in a moment his plans are changed. His agenda is adjusted when this light blinds him. That's not a kind of testimony that goes, Jesus, you, you made me blind. I love you. I will give my life to you. And yet this physical setback was the link in the chain. And for Saul, this light blinding him was a link in the chain that was a setback, and yet it wasn't going to show that God didn't exist. It was to do the opposite, to prove that he does exist. In fact, not just God, but Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Because sometimes it's in that place where God pulls us back that he's refining our character. Sometimes it's in that place where he's hammering out our kings. Sometimes it's that place where he's going to speak to us in, in that suffering. He's going to show us and reveal us the, 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 the nature of our hearts and our character. And when we are ready, God will release us. And so Saul, is now he's, he's standing here and he's completely blind. And he's stranded and he's helpless and he has no idea where to go now. If anything, he just has to turn around and go back to a place he's familiar with. But by God's sovereignty, he's got friends with him. He's got these companions who, verse 8 says, they led him by the hand into Damascus. You might want to underline that line. They led him by the hand into Damascus. Now that is more significant than we realize. That little detail is more significant than we realize. Why? Well, because without them, he would have never made it into the place where the Holy Spirit of God wanted to meet him. 
And check this out. These guys weren't Christians. They were persecutor of Christians. They were traveling along with Saul to Damascus to persecute Christians. They were not Christ's followers. But that day they were Christ's instruments. And that's how sovereign God, our, our, our God is. He can use whoever and whatever he wants as links in people's chains to lead them to Jesus according to his purposes. We see for Saul, I really believe that this was a link in the chain because first a light blinded him. But thank God his friends walked with him. And they lead him into Damascus where I believe we see the third chain, the link, third link of the chain. And here's how it goes. We pick up in verse 10. It says, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to a street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision, in a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Stop right there. Would you write this down as the third link? The third link in the story, a stranger spoke to him. And it wasn't until this third and final link, until a stranger spoke to him, that Saul finally saw. He finally saw Jesus is Lord. That the Jesus who spoke to me and appeared to me on the road and on the way to Damascus is this Jesus who has sent this stranger to me so that I would see that he is pursuing me. Jesus Christ is Lord. How is that for a testimony? I once was blind, but now I see. You could be ministering to that one, and God's going to use a stranger. And yet on the flip side, if you would be available and sensitive to the Lord's lead, maybe you're the stranger. That some other person has been prayed over and poured into for years upon years, and you came along. And you're obedient and you just shared what God put on your heart to share. Guys, we have no idea how God is sovereignly preparing a person for salvation. We have no idea. And so will you be faithful to be a link in the chain? God might use that one, that one, and he might want to blind them he might want to use friends to walk with them. He might want a stranger to speak to them. Or he may use an entirely separate chain of events or people, circumstances. Maybe it's a, a, a sickness that they'll have to endure. Maybe it's the loss of a family member. Maybe it's a championship ring. Maybe it's a brand new friendship at work. Maybe it's a car accident. Who knows, but God is so sovereign Here's what I've come to learn. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 and 7. This has become like a life passage for me, especially when it comes to ministry. But here's the bottom line. God is ultimately the one who changes the heart. And in Corinth, people were, were fighting about who is the greater leader. I follow Apollos. Well, I follow Paul. He's better. And here's what Paul says in verse 5. He says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. What's he saying? He's saying, who, who's Apollos? Who's, who's Paul? Just links in a chain. Because ultimately it's God who changes the heart and saves the soul. He will be the one to draw the person to him. We just gotta be links. We just gotta be available for God's using. And so church, I pray that as you continue to pursue your one, as each one reaches one, that you will do everything you can to be available, to be a link in their life, and yet remember that God is the one, the only one who could change a heart and save a soul. And so we'll leave it into the hands of a sovereign God as we do our part. Amen?